The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Good morning. Feel a little bit like Tony Robbins. Like, good morning. Good morning. Awesome. Um, first of all, thank you for waking up early. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, um, I just wanted to ask you guys to stand up. I know you have like notebooks and stuff, but just stand up for a sec. Okay. And let's have a good morning stretch. I like to stretch. I will be asking you to stretch later too. So, yeah. love this. I should take a picture of this, but I did not. Yeah. All right. Okay, Claudia will take a picture, so just stretch. All right, so I hope you got the, you know, blood flowing now. You can, you can think a bit more clearly. <laughs> Feeling a bit more upbeat. Ooh, Chad's coming. Um, welcome, Chad. <laughs> we just did a morning stretch, so just before you have a seat, you can take a moment to stretch it out. Um, all right, so I want to give you a bit of an idea about what I'm going to talk about, because it's a little bit different than what everybody else has been talking about. Um, so basically, what I'm really, really excited about, because we've been talking about so much about learning, about learning languages specifically, about how we learn languages. But what about what else is happening outside of those languages that we're learning? So we're, we're going through a whole transformation process as individuals, as a community also. And uh, we're learning stuff about ourselves. And that's maybe the stuff that we talk about in conversations, but not so much. I've actually heard it in a bunch of different conversations, which got me really excited. But I'm happy that we have this one hour to kind of discuss all the other stuff about our perceptions of ourselves and how we are changing, how we are being impacted by the languages that we're learning. So if you don't know what that means yet, <coughs> it'll, it'll get more clear. Um, because basically, I have uh, three steps basic, uh, that we're going to talk about today. Um, just kind of very loose steps going forward about how this transformation process happens in each of us. And uh, I'm going to talk about my own story about moving, I'll explain from where to where, um, and, and what I think those three steps are based on that. And what I really am really excited about, and every time I was thinking about giving this talk, I was like, I can't wait to hear what you guys have to add. So mine is just one strand in a bunch of, you know, like those friendship bracelets, if you guys ever made those when you were younger and you braid them all together. So I, I want, each of you has one of those colors, you know, and I want them all, I want us all to interweave them. If you read my About Me, I said I like cheese and, you know, kind of corny stuff like that. So that's, I like that <laughs> stuff. Um, all right, so about this three-step process, you're going to recognize it intuitively. Um, so it's, yeah, let's just get into it. I want to tell you first about my inspiration you guys. Some of you are in Novi Sad, some of you were here last year, some of you are just new to the community, so welcome. Um, my inspiration uh, in thinking about these topics about, about identity and about sharing them with other people and realizing that we have a lot of stuff in common came from meeting um, this community last year in, uh, in Berlin. Um, and um, Hold on, I lost my slide for a sec. Um, yeah, so basically, after the conference, I was so overcome with, I'm going to come stand over here. I was so overcome with this feeling of, of um, feeling at home with strangers. So people that I had met for a day, people I had one conversation with um, over, you know, like uh, f six days we were here, um, that, that changed me. I went home and I said, I have a friend. That is a real, real friend who understands me, even though we only spoke for 10 to 15 minutes. Or I, sp I spent four days with this person, but that, that really shaped me. That really changed me. And I feel that we understood each other on a different level than if I just met a random stranger near my home, let's say. And so I started thinking about this concept of why. You know, why is it that we get along so well when we go to these events, but in truth, we barely know each other, or do we? So that, that's kind of the question that I, I want you guys to think about, and you can consider this is my opinion. So I think that we're, in a sense, we're all kind of explorers. We're exploring languages, we're exploring cultures, but at the same time, we're exploring learning, and we are exploring ourselves and others. So I think, in a sense, 
we're, we're a little bit addicted to this because I think a lot of people here, we go above and beyond. Um, and this whole process of understanding, of connection, of growth, um, that happens in each and every one of us. And I think that's kind of what brings us together so that when we spend these six days together, it's like revolutionary. Um, and then the last thing that I think we're addicted to is something that Roberto mentioned last night while we were talking, and it's, it's freedom. It's liberation. And I find that when I'm able to switch between languages, I'm able to feel really, really free. Like, I, I'm not limited by one certain way of thinking or one certain way of expressing myself. If there's a better word in a different language and I can use it, that gives me this feeling that I can just go, I can break out of something. Um, so, yes. Oh, and just, just so you know, so I think that my personal point of view about this, does uh, personality change when we change language? I think that we are who we are, no matter what language we're speaking. But what I believe is that it's like a window into yourself, languages, and every language puts you in different situations that allow you to see yourself from different angles. So if you're looking into a building from the outside, and with French, you can see yourself from this angle, but then let's say with Japanese, you see yourself from this angle that you would have never seen before without this language. Um, that's kind of how I think about it, and I'll welcome you guys. When you see pink slides, then there's gonna be questions for the audience, and you can also um, share your point of view there. So a little bit about my story. Um, I was born here, I was born in Bucharest, Romania, um, and back then my name was Irina Pravets, so that's how we pronounce it in Romanian. And when I was five and a half, we moved to Montreal in Canada, and then I became Irina Prave. Um, so we were there for about four years until my parents decided to move to the English part of Canada in Toronto, and then I was Irina Prevet. And um, I studied Spanish in school. Um, I went to a French school throughout because my parents didn't want me to lose my French. And um, then I got really interested in German and Spanish at the same time, focused on Spanish in high school, which is why my Spanish is a little rusty right now, and uh, German in university. So when I went to Germany, <coughs> then I was Irina Pravet. And uh, I met my boyfriend in Germany on exchange and uh, later moved to Finland. He's Finnish. And Recently, I'm more Irina Pravet. So people ask me, okay, how do you pronounce your name? And, or how is it really pronounced? And for as long as I can remember, I've always been translating for the language. There is no you know, language against which to compare it, that it's a little bit more like this or it's a little bit more like that. Um, so this is just a name, but your name is kind of who you are. And when you have this flexibility, I mean, my mom said she wanted me to have an international name. But I really don't think she thought about what that means for your identity, because when you're always changing your name or the pronunciation of your name, luckily I, didn't, I wasn't like Michael, and then I became like Mikhail. And like, <laughs> it, it didn't change, you know, really the name, but, but still the, the accent, the pronunciation, then it's also like, where do I belong? And from here, it was, it was quite easy to go to Canada, because in Canada, the culture is plural, it's multicultural. So it's expected that you come from somewhere else, and in essence, that's part of what makes you Canadian. Um, but then when I came back here, then, or well, came back to Europe, then things got a bit more confusing, because suddenly I had to explain where I was born, what my native language was, which is another confusing subject I will not cover in this talk, um, and, and uh, you know where I live. And what's gotten even more confusing than explaining to Finnish people that I'm Canadian and Romanian is explaining to Canadian people that I'm Canadian but born in Romania but I actually live in Finland. So um, it's easy to see how you can kind of lose yourself in all of this and it might not seem like such a big deal, but when there's a series of boxes and people are always trying to put you inside one box and you're always trying to break out of that box, and uh, you know, say, no, 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 I'm actually, you, you can say I'm this, but I'm also this, and if you avoid this, I'm not really giving you the full picture, but in a sense, nobody cares, they just wanna put you in a box and move on. Um, so yeah, I really, I thought a lot about, you know, who am I really? And I think this all kind of, this funny story that happened to me while I was studying in Mannheim, in Germany, I was, I was studying Mandarin, and th this is the perfect story to explain this whole name thing. 
Um, we, in the very first Mandarin class, the class was in German, by the way, um, and this is pretty much like all my Mandarin. <laughs> we were learning how to introduce ourselves. So the first day, uh, the teacher said, Wo shi, and then she said her name. And then we went around. She said it maybe three times. She wrote it in pinyin on the board, and then she said, okay, now you guys try. And so we went around. Wo shi. Claudio. Wo shi Silvan. Wo shi Antonio. Wo shi Dragos. And then it's my turn. And I say, Wo shi. I actually just felt exactly how I felt back in that room. And it was like, okay, I have to say my name, but now how do I translate it? How do I say my name with a Mandarin accent? And everyone's staring at me. I'm thinking, okay, but wait, it's German. And everybody else who said it had a German accent, so I should put on a German accent, but wait, no, I just have to say it in Mandarin, but I don't know how to say it in Mandarin. So this went on for maybe like five minutes, but at a very, very much more accelerated pace. And, uh, and then I think I said something like, Irina. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll try to add tones to it, but I don't know how to do that, and maybe a little bit of a German accent. So yeah, it gets kind of ridiculous sometimes, and you feel like an idiot, because you're like, everybody else knows what box they belong in, and I'm not able to like break that down. So, that, that's what happened in Mannheim. Um, so basically, in 2009, after I came back from Mannheim, so I did my exchange, I was studying in Montreal, I went on exchange, and... Um, and when I came back from exchange, I, I was at a complete crossroads. I didn't know what I should do. Um, so kind of the next step, this is I think the catalyst. It's really like, okay, you gotta leave home. Because in my, in my case, I, I, I had studied business and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that because it was a compromise with my parents. What do you wanna do when you grow up? Speak German. <laughs> okay, what are you gonna do with that? Just speak German? <laughs> Okay, so why don't you study business while you speak German and then you can figure it out from there. So that was our compromise. So as graduation was nearing, I was like still not really getting past that speaking German part. And so for me, coming back from Europe after the exchange and, and thinking, okay, what am I gonna do now? I'm gonna get a job. And in Canada, you have like two weeks vacation a year. So that's like 50 weeks a year you're gonna be sitting at that desk. And uh, I was just not prepared for that. So what I was thinking, okay, what is it that I like to do in this speak German? Okay, that was a little bit restrictive. So I was like, okay, well, why don't I just, I go somewhere new, I'll go somewhere new. And this, for me, this was when I left home. And I think for many people, it could be, it could be a metaphorical thing or kind of a more abstract thing, like I have to move out of my parents' place or I, I have to get a job and support myself or you know any kind of big change in your life. It doesn't just have to be at the beginning of your adult life. That's kind of the leaving home, but eventually there is a physical <laughs> process of actually leaving that safe space, whatever home is, which we can maybe talk about next year because that's a whole other topic. Um, so yes, so with leaving home, let me just... Um, I was, sorry, um, sorry, give me one sec. Yeah, so I had, I had an opportunity because in, in Finland, uh, sorry, in, um, uh, Germany, I wasn't in Finland yet, in, f in Germany I had met a guy, as I told you, that's the reason I moved to Finland, so I had to, I had to choose, and I was thinking, in Europe, I can go, I can speak something other than English, because in Canada they speak English everywhere, um, almost, or where I was living, um, and I can, I can go immerse myself in something completely different, and there was a certain draw to the Finnish language, like, uh, there's nothing like it anywhere else, and you won't understand anything. Um, and, and then I have to figure everything out from stop signs to street signs to what people are saying and that's going to be like really exciting. So I left home. Yeah. And I went there. <laughs> so not Helsinki, but there, which is Tampere. And I've, I've included some of my photographs from that first winter because I moved there January 3rd, which, um, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think this picture was like, the second day I was there at night. And it looked like a winter, won winter wonderland we were touching down. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was like five o'clock in the afternoon or something, I don't know. But like, we had gray skies like this for the whole time. And um, what I was actually doing, pardon? Where's the sun? 
where's the sun? We didn't see it for like two weeks. I, I remember though, it moved there. It was like, oh, Finland. And then like, oh, do they have sun here? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was like the first two weeks and we also had a really cold winter that winter. So it was a little bit abnormal, but Canadians, that wasn't a big deal for us, for me. Um, okay, so this first kind of time in Finland, I would say, I thought I was moving to Finland, but in essence what I was doing is I was immigrating in Finland, and, uh, to Finland. And I was immigrating for the second time in my young life, I was 21 at the time, um, and I didn't really know that I was immigrating because I would just tell myself, well, I, it's just a plane ride away, I can always go home if I want. And I think this is what Robert Frost, the poet, was talking about when he penned the phrase, so lost you find yourself. So like just geographically lost maybe, but then culturally lost as well. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a bit about the differences I think between being five and being 21 when you immigrate. Um, so language is the most obvious one, but in the case of moving to Montreal when I was five, um, and speaking Romanian and then kind of understanding French. Um, in Finland, there was, you know, you didn't really have much to connect with other languages. So I'd brought lots of identities with me, but none of them were the Finnish identity. <laughs> that, that was what was missing. Um, community is a huge thing. So as a five-year-old, you're just like taken somewhere and then they leave you somewhere and then those people take care of you. But nobody did that in Tampere. It was just, you're here, it's cold, and no one's looking at you, and no one's talking to you, and you have no community at all to plug into. Um, and, and that, yeah, it, it weighs on you. But don't worry, this is gonna get upbeat too. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just setting the scene. Um, the concept of foreignness is really, really different. Uh, this, was, this was shocking for me because, um, in Finland, you have such a homogenous country with uh, people who look very similar to each other. Um, and in Canada, you have this you know, multiculturalism. I think in Toronto, there are over 50% of the people living in Toronto are actually born outside of Canada. So that's huge, that's, that's a huge difference. And um, foreignness in itself is completely normal. And in, in Finland, it stands out, like people look at you, you look different, even I look different in Finland. And so, so I'm not like used to you know, being looked at for that because, because it's supposed to be like, yeah, we're different, that's, yeah, that's Canada. But, pardon? That's normal to be different. It's normal to be different, exactly. But when it's a really small and homogenous country, it's so different than a multicultural, bigger, bigger country. And, um, I think this norms, this, this whole, like I brought uh, an identity with me or many identities, but none of them were Finnish. It's when you interact with people on the street, that's when you notice the differences. But if you don't have a community in which to kind of consistently interact with people and try to figure out what those different norms are, that can be um, really challenging because you're in a sense not moving forward. Again, this will get more upbeat, I promise. Um, so, uh, oh, wait. So when I put it up here, it looks really neat and tidy, but when I was there, it was really gray and cold and dark and lonely, and like I didn't have a slide to explain how I was feeling. <laughs> so in that sense, like hindsight is a really, really beautiful thing. You know, you can be like, wow, look, I've learned so much, but this is all like five years later, five and a half years later. Um, so I think that what happens to us is that we kind of close up, you know, and you guys are all sitting there, you can kind of do this, you can just, like it weighs heavy on you and I promise I'll take you out of this. And you just kind of, you just kind of feel like really, really tight and tense and it doesn't feel good. So actually what positive psychology teaches us is that when we are feeling negative or stressed or anything negative basically, we start to only see one path. We start to only see one thing that we can do, which is either closing or running away. But we left home for a reason, so we wanna tap into that voice that told us to leave home in the first place, that told us that this was gonna be good for us and that told us that we would learn something from this. And in order to do that, we have to find a way to cope. So again, going back to positive psychology, we want to, we want to frame this in a different way. We wanna find a way to break out of that cocoon or like, uncomfortable body position. Um, so just because I got you guys to stretch once, um, I can ask you guys to stand up again and just kind of notice the difference from this to this. And 
taking up lots of space and kind of, you know, you get, you get more, more from your body. You get more blood flowing through all your muscles. By the way, I also coach gymnastics, so that's why I keep doing this. Um, <laughs> and you start to then see more opportunities. So now I want to ask you guys, because it took me a really long time to figure out how to do this, but think about a time when you yourself felt lost, like you'd gone way too far from home. And um, I'm, I'm going to give everybody a chance to think about this, so please don't put your hands up yet. And I want you to share with us how you coped through that. So just a couple of seconds, but I'll tell you when you can put your hand up if you have something. Anybody want to share? Chris? Uh, is this on? Is it working? Yeah, it's on. It's on. Hi. Uh, I got lost in Beijing uh, in an embarrassing way. It wasn't a cool kind of lost where you're like, oh, man, I don't know where I am. Look at this stuff. Uh, <laughs> I took the subway to a stop I thought I knew well. And it came out at about 10 p.m. in the bottom of a closed shopping mall. And uh, so all the lights were off and everything was like gated and closed. But there was like a single line of lights to take me where I thought everyone needed to exit, get out on the street. So I walked along the lighted hallway and out the door into a completely black like uh, staircase. And when there's no lights on in China, I had learned already to make noise or like shout or like stomp or something, and the lights will turn on for a few minutes and turn back off. So it's very, very dark, and there's like the exit signs are the only things on, so it's like red, you know, and very menacing. I thought, where am I? So I started walking up because I thought I was underground, mm -hmm. which I was. Started walking up in the staircase and came to a completely, the exit signs are off, came to a completely dark place. I'm alone, I don't even have any friends in China yet. So I don't know what to do, who to call or anything. I don't know where I am. And I start to kind of stomp and make noise and go woo, woo, and stomp. And it just echoes through and the lights do not come on. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going to die in a staircase <laughs> under horror a mall. Horror movie. <laughs> yeah, like a horror movie. So I finally like, found a door that was not bolted shut. And I opened it and it was uh, even further. I don't know how far underground I was. But I managed to cope with it and like walk out through a parking lot onto the street and then walk home by thinking about uh, how it was eventually going to end one way or another, and I was going to find my way out. It didn't, it, maybe it would take hours or days, but I would be, <laughs> find my way out of this place. So focusing on like, eventually it would be over was the way I coped with it. Yeah. Thank you. There's someone behind you. Hi there, I was, uh, cycling with my husband in Scotland one time and it was very very cold and dark um, we'd gone out too late and we were we'd ha we'd had a map but we missed a turning on the map and then got completely confused on the map the problem was it was sort of three o'clock in the afternoon the lights are falling it's beginning to snow it's very cold you've got kind of one chocolate bar between the two of you we had been married a little while but he's always he's always sort of he, he's at one point we'd crossed over a river, uh, which we'd walked sort of through, re really shallow river. And I realized we were completely lost, completely lost. But obviously I was with him. And then he says, I'll tell you what, you stay here and I'll go all ahead and I'll find the path. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> 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 and uh, I sat down and thinking, I'm absolutely exhausted. We've got enough, wa obviously, water, completely lost. Hadn't told anybody. We were staying in a little sort of chalet that we'd rented, but there was n virtually nobody else around in the chalet. So we'd told nobody where we were. He is highly capable, highly fit. He could definitely survive without me. <laughs> definitely. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, God, I don't want to do this. And then I'm thinking, I can't go on. But then I thought, but I can go back. And this one thought of whatever I've done, I can actually retrace the steps. And then by retracing the steps, so obviously we did it together, and it was going to be very, very long because we'd, we'd gone off the path and we'd, we'd taken wrong turnings and everything. But we came up to a point where 
we could begin to see a path that we should have taken. And then the minute we relaxed, we also got quite generous with each other and neither of us wanted to have the chocolate bar because we wanted to give it to the other person. But your whole outlook completely changed when you saw that, in fact, the route to take was the route back, um, which was the route that you'd taken already. Um, and then, because you were up higher, you could see which way to go. So th the thought process changed. But it certainly taught me never to go <laughs> in the highlands of Scotland <laughs> in winter, in the snow, <laughs> at three o'clock in the afternoon, because nobody is going to come and get you. <laughs> even <though. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And actually, I love the way that you explained that because it was such a beautiful metaphor also for when you were higher up, you could see better. And just like we drag ourselves like mentally out of the dumps, then we can see better to where we can go. So ev that was one instance, but it, it works on so many levels. Was there another hand? Hi. Um, yeah, uh, my experience was similar to what you described. I moved to Spain. Uh, I was older than you, but still. Um, I had a girlfriend and a flatmate, and that was it. I knew nobody else. And this was uh, before th the internet that we know today. So it was the dial-up days, and there was no meetup.com. There was no couch surfing. There was no none of these groups where you could just go out and have instant friends. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I felt extremely lost. And also, I had uh, no expectation of having culture shock. Uh, I think, you know, England, Spain, it's not that far. It's not like going to Japan. Uh, in fact, that was just rubbish. I had total culture shock. Uh, I kept going downstairs to buy something in, uh, you know, in, the, in the afternoon. And, and again and again, day after day, the shops were closed. Of course, it's siesta, and I, every day I forgot. Uh, and I had to go back upstairs without what I wanted. Um, and uh, I was like, holy shit, how can it be so different here? It's weird. And, um, you know, getting used to eating at completely different times. The fact that it's still morning at one o'clock. <laughs> Anyone that? Yeah, still morning at one o'clock, yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, and then, you know, you don't have dinner until 10. Uh, and, you know, now, now, of course, I can't eat earlier than 10. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I remember uh, lying on my bed, being very <laughs> depressed and thinking, this is after being there for like maybe six months, um, thinking, geez, I, I don't remember the last time I went out and had a really good time and, and just enjoyed life, you know, uh, and laughed. And uh, I was thinking, oh, maybe I should just go home. And uh, and then I was thought to myself, look, I'm, I'm sick of this. This is bullshit. I'm, uh, I'm just going to stay here until it works. And it was just making that decision of... Um, uh, whatever it throws at me, I can handle it, and I'm going to stay here until it works. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, if that takes a year, great. If it takes two years, if it takes ten years, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was just that that decision that changed everything for me. How how did that decision impact then your actions from that point on? Uh, yeah, well, the first thing was like, okay, I need some friends. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I um, I went back to the UK and got my guitar and brought it back to Spain. Um, started playing guitar again, and I went to uh, around the local music shops uh, to look for a band, mm -hmm. uh, thinking if I find a band, I'll have people to hang out with as well, mm -hmm. and um, and that so that went from from finding two or three people to play in a band with to like a few years later I had my own record label and concert promotion company and was touring all over Spain with bands and yeah, c her whole life was really <laughs> pretty pretty crazy. Thank you so much for sharing, all of you. Thank you. So I had I had just a couple things written down. Um, basically, when you're when you're out of balance, when you've kind of lost that sense of of uh, you know I don't really understand the world anymore because it seems that all I do is wrong in this context. Um, you know, staying actively fit. That, that helps a lot, breathing fresh air, staying close to nature, but also just sports, dance, physical self-expression. And then also, um, I, I like meditation and art, you know, just doing something, it doesn't have to look pretty, you just do it for yourself. Um, yeah, then you can fuse the mind and body, and, and basically, yeah, this just until you can pull yourself out of that, these are, these are just some ideas, but. Um, and I like what you said, sorry, what was your name? Robert. Um, what Robert said, when you went back home, you got your guitar and then you brought it to Spain. And I think it's funny because when we can't do everything, 
you can't do everything anymore. Now you, there's, a, there's a culture shock, there's a language barrier, there's all these things standing in your way. So if you can't do everything, what do you really, really want to do? And for some, that might be playing guitar. For me, it was doing gymnastics. For everybody, I'm sure there is as, as many things, you know, as there are people in this room, uh, the things that we really, really want to focus on and starting there. So, um, Um, I found this this picture actually while I was doing a completely unrelated thing, like writing my master's thesis, of um, who we are and what we do. So I think that when you leave home, then you're almost like pieces of yourself that you never notice. They separate almost like water and oil because there's the things that you've always done because that's how they're done, where you come from. And then there's the, the pieces of you that want to do that and then there's the pieces that you don't want to do because that's just... You know, the obligation is both positive and negative. There's things you like and things you don't like. And so when you start to kind of separate these pieces, I don't know if you can read it, but there's behavior, environment, and personal. So behavior, or let's talk about environment first. It's what everybody else is doing. And I'll take the example of smiling at people in Canada versus Finland. So um, <laughs> David and I were talking about this yesterday, that you see strangers on the street, you make eye contact with them, and then you smile to show that you're not evil. Uh, or that you mean no harm. And I've heard, I don't know, was it in Tibet, I want to say, that people actually stick out their tongues to show, yeah, to show that they're not evil. That, yeah? <laughs> that, I, I, now I, I'm not sure if I'm getting the country wrong, so don't quote me on that, but you can find it on Google, I'm sure. Um, pardon? New Zealand? Okay. Yeah. I know for sure, for sure there's, th so that's another one. So yeah, you have all these customs. And uh, so that's your environment. That's what everybody else is doing. Now, whether or not that's what you want to do, that's what you've been doing behaviorally. That's what you've been doing as a habit. And, and these look really nice in this chart, just like my other you know, slide on hindsight and splitting things up, but you really like, you don't notice these things until you can't do them anymore. Um, and then personal is what you want to do. What, what do you, how do you like to greet people? How do you like to connect with people? And so I, I'll, I'll tell you my story about smiling. Basically, I'm a very friendly person. I like to smile. It makes me feel good to smile. Um, and I thought this was a Canadian thing, and I thought it was a me thing, and I thought they were fused. Um, so when I got to Finland, I would look. I, so I had no friends, and I would be like, oh, by the time I wake up, because it was really dark, um, you know, I'd drag myself out of bed and then go to the city, and I'd make eye contact with people and just like, there's nothing coming back at me. There's no connection. There's, uh, you know, and I feel embarrassed because people like look away and you're like, oh, what's wrong with me? So, so you get this like, okay, what's wrong with me? And why are they so rude, you know? And Paula, I don't think Finnish people are rude. I'm going to spin this around. I'm going to explain what's happening. So what I slowly started to realize is that Finnish people in this context, they have a different way of acknowledging each other. And if we're here... I know he's here because I see him out of my peripheral vision and he knows I'm here, but we don't need to acknowledge each other. We're, it's just self-obvious or selbstverständlich. Uh, it's just obvious that we, you know, there's a person here. In Canada, we like to acknowledge that person and connect with them and that's totally fine. So what I did after a really scary experience where I was just like forcefully smiling at people and then this like person started smiling at me like this and I was like, okay, that's karma. I can't, I can't, I mean, I did that to a bunch of people so I can't be surprised that that happened to me. Uh, I decided, okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to do as the Finns do. I'm going to, you know, imitate, I'm going to be a chameleon and I'm just going to totally fit in. So I just stopped smiling and, um, and just went about my life for four years. And then I came here last year and the first person I saw upstairs in the lobby, you know, they looked at me, they smiled and I looked away. <laughs> And then I was like, wait, wait, you're not in Finland, fix it. So then I was like, oh, like maybe we can, no, okay, they're looking away now, I've offended them. <laughs> um, but then after that, then now, you know, you see the, the sign and you say hi to everybody and yeah. So when I went, I realized after six days, like my face hurt from smiling and I was like, I like this. So like my environment, you know, it stayed the same. It was still Finland and my behavior had changed. I had adopted the Finnish, the Finnish uh, way of smiling. But personally, I wasn't satisfied. I still wanted to smile at people. So I came up with this revolutionary concept of smiling when I feel like it in Finland and not expecting anything in return. And this was like, 
because because suddenly it did I I, fr I framed it differently and it didn't matter because I could do what I wanted to do. I could take what I liked and I could take what I didn't like. And some days, especially if you live in the Nordic countries, you'll understand this. It's great. You don't have to smile at anyone, you don't have to look at anyone, you could just like whew. And and that's great that you can switch between those. So thank you guys for smiling at me last year. Um okay, now I'm a big fan of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And uh, you'll see why that's relevant in a sec. Um, so basically, this, this, you know, what's left when you take away everything you've done? And like, who are you after? So I'm just going to set the scene. I really love this video because it kind of explains what we're talking about, but in more poetic and fictional terms. So there's this huge fight going on. You don't have to watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer to understand this. I hope you can see it, though. There's a f huge f uh, fight going on. And Buffy's ex-boyfriend, who has now become evil, um, you know, they're in a showdown to the death, and uh, he, he's like, he's kind of been playing with her mentally. He like killed some of her friends, and, and now they're in this fight. It's just one-on-one, -on -one and you know, bad against uh, good versus evil, and all of that. And this is what happens. Oh, shoot. No. He's evil. No weapons, no friends, no hope. Take all that away, and what's left? Me. Could you guys hear? Yeah, so he said, so that's, you know, take no friends, no weapons, no home, hope. Take all that away, and what's left? Me. So this is kind of like if you watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you're living in Finland and you're feeling really sad, <laughs> you're just like, I am Buffy. <laughs> and this, you know, I just have to tap into that strength. Yeah. Oops. Unrelated. Thank you. Huge compliment. Um, yeah. Okay. So I did something because basically I just, I wanted to put something a bit more specifically. So what were the things that I was struggling with in Finland? Um, yes. Don't draw attention to yourself and being loud and being foreign. These are things that stand out. And uh, like I mentioned in the, um, homogenous culture, you know, you kind of want to all be on the same level and like not stand out for different things. Um, not making eye contact or smiling at strangers. We've talked about that. Um, speaking turns. Oh my gosh. So I speak and then I stop speaking and then it's your turn to speak. And then you speak and then you stop speaking and then it's my turn to speak. And if you interrupt someone, the person will stop talking and say, okay, well, I'm going to stop talking because obviously you want to speak. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine a polyglot conference with that rule. <laughs> Now, I, I, I pick up on these things pretty quickly. And I noticed that every time I cut someone off, it was like, I did something really bad. <laughs> I should not have done that. And the person would just stop speaking and stare at me. Even if I was saying, yeah, yeah. And then they would just stop speaking and stare at me. And I, in these cases, I just wanted to crawl under a rock and die because there was really like, you're like, oh, that was really, really bad. And I realized that all I had to do was, oh, I'm sorry, keep going. I'm just, I'm just agreeing with you. And the person would keep going right away, no, no, not offended or no harm done. But the worst part was that I was aware of this and my mouth would still open and make noise because it's just a habit, going back to that behavioral picture. And little to no small talk was also a challenge. So people don't talk for the sake of talking or connecting. They talk about what needs to be talked about. So like the weather or other things. And, and what I, it took me a while to figure out that people actually, um, a great way to meet people in Finland is um, to do something. Because there's, a, oh, there's a joke. I actually didn't even plan this. Um, okay, so, so th these two guys go to a bar and they have a beer and they sit down. They go, so one of them says to the other, let's say that Ari is talking to Heiki. And Ari says, so Heiki, how's, uh, how's your family? Huva, huva, good. They're, they're fine. He says, uh, and work, how's that going? It's fine, it's going good. 
take another sip. He's like, and um, how about how about your wife? And he's like, oh, perkele, which is a bad word in Finnish. Like, did we come here to talk or did we come here to drink? <laughs> so that kind of tells you a little bit about you know the the small talk and and just having different different um, perception of how that's done. So what really helped me understand this? So now we can joke about it and we can say, okay, well, you don't do these things. And these are kind of rules that are given to foreigners. Like in Finland, we don't do this and we don't do this. And you can kind of get it, but you don't really understand why. Because it just seems like something arbitrary that's like, okay, it's dark and cold, so we do these things. <laughs> Until one day, um, my mom sent me this personality test and she was like, you have to take this, it's so great. And we get really excited about this stuff and we get each other excited about different things. And uh, have you guys heard of the Myers-Briggs type indicator, MBTI? Hands up. Okay, so, and who hasn't heard of it? Because I just can't tell if that's more or less. About half, half. Okay, well, I'm gonna give you a rundown of it and how it entirely like revolutionized my way of understanding who I am and, and who I am not and why these things made no sense and how they then were actually advantages in Finland. So um, there's actually, hold on, I'm gonna do it this way. So there's four different axes in this test. So there's four things that you're, you're um, like you can say about yourself and then they combine. So if there's two choices on each two spectrums from from um, two to, okay, I'll just start explaining it. Okay, so <laughs> the first axis is introverted, extroverted. And um, this is not, I don't believe that someone is exclusively introverted or exclusively extroverted. Um, we can talk about this for hours later. Uh, but basically it's just that certain things you will do better on your own first if you've had a bit of time to think about it. And certain things you will do better with people when you have the chance to interact with them. So this is kind of our internal, balancing system that there will always be things we do better on our own and always be things that we do better with others. You're still with me? Yep. Okay, ask me if there's something that doesn't make sense. Then there's, uh, N is for intuition because I was taken for introversion <laughs> and S is for sensing. So this is how we collect information about the world around us. So some of us trust our five senses, what we can hear, what we can smell, what we can taste, what we can touch, what we can see. Okay, and that is, that is gold. That is the only thing you'll believe. And some of us are intuitive. We kind of, we get, you know, a bunch of information, bits and pieces, and we kind of just make sense of it. So the difference comes down to, or you can see this a lot with intuitives are more living in the future. They're always thinking about what's to come. Whereas sensors are able to enjoy the present moment um, a lot better because they're, you know, they're using their senses, basically. So that's why they have these names. Um, also, it's not always the case, but intuitives sometimes work like non-linearly. So you're just like, oh, this, and then connect with this. And then where sensors are like, give me steps to work forward. So you could probably guess which one Germany is. Um, <laughs> and Finland, by the way. Um, and then there's what kind of information. So you're collecting information with intuition and sensing, but then what kind of information are you collecting? So whether that is thinking, um, like about people, processes, stuff like that, or whether that is feeling. Um, so that's basically about noticing things about people. So head versus heart, objective versus subjective, stuff like that. And then you have this um, way of seeing um, the world that's basically, do you like closure or do you like things to be open-ended? So that's just perceiving as open-ended and closure is the judger, but it doesn't matter what they're called. Um, okay, so I was gonna ask you guys like, how do you collect information? So just, this is not like you always do it this way. Everyone will do it in different ways. It's just, which one do you use more often? And I know you're gonna be like, Irina, this is too simplistic, but trust me, it has a lot of insight. Um, so you can answer this question for yourself. And then what kind of information do you usually tend to notice? And sorry, I have to speed up a bit because I just noticed what the time was. Um, so what I did is that I actually, I have to disclaim, give a disclaimer. I did my own personality test and I was like, yeah, it's obvious. But then when I started doing other people's tests, so like I made my boyfriend do his and I was like, whoa, do you think like this? Because that did not, you think the way you think, but you never thought about, or I never thought about how other people think. And then that got me really excited. Um, so then I started thinking, how do, like, how does a society think? And if it's a small homogenous country like Finland can actually figure out what their MBTI type is, not people, 
but just the society as a whole. And this is why there's a disclaimer, because when you're talking about this stuff, you're likely going to say something stupid by mistake. <laughs> so this was what I came up with with mine. So I was extroverted feeler, introverted intuitive, and then like the sensing thinking was like kind of on the bottom, so my weaknesses basically. And these are, they can usually be private, but here I am showing mine. So this is exactly something an extroverted feeler would do. I'm going to tell you this about myself, which other people would never share. Um, but yeah, I'm kind of an open book like that. And then the Finnish one is really interesting because it's exactly the opposite of mine. <laughs> so when I realized this, I was like, wow. Because when you're feeling really like lost in a society and you don't know like why everything you do is wrong and you find this and you're like, oh, this explains it all. And so then I started seeing my strengths as you know, some of the society's weaknesses. And I started seeing their strengths as my weaknesses. And I started thinking of it as a collaborative project with just like an abstract idea. That I don't know if that made sense to you. That's my intuitive talking. Um, so then suddenly I could see things with a purpose. Like these things make a lot of sense when you think of them in terms of the thinking sensor profile, that combination. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to fast forward, so, but we can talk about this later or we can talk about it in the comments. So, um, yeah, I wanted to ask you guys to think about a place where you were unfamiliar with the norms and what did you end up learning. But I think I have four minutes, so let's, I'm also going to, oh my god, I think my last part is really, really short. So basically, <laughs> this becoming who you are is then stepping up. So you figured out who you are and who you're not. So you have to become this, this person basically, that you, that you want to be. And so we've been talking a lot about identity, and I think that identity is fascinating because it's a really personal thing. You get to decide who you want to be, right? But it's public and it's negotiable, so that kind of seems like an oxymoron because you then you're like, I am this, but if you don't believe I'm this, then I am not this because I keep trying to prove that I am this. You know, just like you're stomping. Um, so, and it's, and it's an abstract concept because you can't quite place yourself in a box in a concrete way or in several boxes in a concrete way. It's, it's really out there. And we want to be understood as people. So what I think happens for us to be able to step up into this become who you are is uh, we have to start being courageous and we have to kind of reframe this whole thing as, as coming to our advantage as, um, hold on, that didn't make sense. <laughs> Um, so we just have to reframe the way that, that, we, that we see things in order to, um, I don't, I, sorry, I don't know what I was thinking back then, but I know what power pose means. Um, so, so basically, it, it's, it's just about, you got to be courageous, and then you got to start getting out there, and you have to be like, okay, I am this, and then you start testing your idea, right? And there's an amazing TEDx talk given, or TED talk given by Amy Cuddy where she talks about power poses and how they change our brain. So stand up really quickly and we're gonna do a power pose. Um, basically what this is is that if you stand with your body in a certain way that makes you feel important, which uh, for animals is like take up as much space as possible, or Wonder Woman, <laughs> or if you're sitting at like a desk, you know, you can put your feet up on the desk. But let's all do the Wonder Woman. Like this, like this. And if you do this for two minutes, I recently did it before a job interview and it worked, I got the job. Um, <laughs> if you do it for two minutes, it will actually change the way that your brain works. It will, it will produce more of those hormones that make you feel confident as opposed to if you're like this. So, you know, little things like this can get you feeling more confident, feeling like that person that you want to be. And in that TED Talk, Amy Cuddy said, don't fake it till you make it, fake it until you become it. And so that's what we need to do with identity. It's, it's really like when you know what it is that you want to be, who it is that you want to be, that's the hardest part. And then just having the courage to go forward, that's really, it only gets better and better from there. Um, I don't know if I have time. Yes, sit down, sorry. It's not two minutes, okay. Uh, yeah, and then the questions can be our conversation for the end. So what happened is that I started speaking more Finnish. I started feeling more confident about myself. And the things that had confused me earlier actually made a lot of sense to me because I understood them from the inside, from, from the inside the Finnish head. Um, so it didn't really work when people explained, you know, in Finland we are quiet. 
it, it only worked when I was in a situation and I felt that I needed to be quiet. Um, so, story. I was on a walk and I sat by this garden, and these are pictures from the garden near my house in Finland in the summer when nature explodes and it's really, really beautiful. And I sat down to meditate. Um, already I was feeling a bit like vulnerable, like, okay, I'm gonna go outside and sit down and close my eyes and people will think I'm weird, but it doesn't matter. Um, and this man came up to me, and this never happens in Finland. Um, and he asked me to play frisbee with him. So it was him and this one other guy, yeah. Paula, has this ever happened to you in Finland? No, so strangers don't invite you to play frisbee. And especially like people who are sitting there with their eyes closed. <laughs> and I go, me? And there's like no one around. And he's like, yeah, do you want to play frisbee? This was happening in Finnish, by the way. And I said, no, thank you. So my brain, my English brain was like, say something else, make an excuse, explain yourself. This is rude, you're being rude. And then my Finnish brain is like, there is nothing else you could say. But I said, he, so he said, are you sure you don't want to play? And I said, hey, guitos, uh, I just want to sit here really quietly. No, thank you. I just want to sit here really quietly. Muta guitos, but thank you. And he left. And I thought about that for a really long time after because I was like, wow, that would have gone so different in English. I would have felt obliged to explain why I was, you know, saying no. But in Finnish, that made perfect sense. And it would have actually been more, less authentic to say more. And then I was like, wow, I'm Finnish now. <laughs> Finnish. <laughs> Finnish. So, so this is kind of the amazing power of, you know, you get all lost and then you're like, who do I want to be? And then you become it by mistake, but you don't notice. So don't think that it happens on slides and then in life it's more the other way around. So um, that's not very important. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> well, we don't have time. Uh, so basically I, wa I wanted to open up the floor to you guys. There was the question from the, from the previous slide about if you were somewhere where you didn't know the norms, what did you learn about yourself? And then I'll also add this question to it. So think about a time when you acted in a really unexpected way, so like my Frisbee story, um, because of the language you were speaking. And I don't put your hands up yet. I want to give the introverts a chance to think uh, first, and then I'll give you like 20 seconds, and then let's share until the end of the talk. Anybody? Yeah? Tristan's coming. Hold on. I'm not sure this is exactly what you want, but... It's okay. I mean, I personally, am, I personally am very introverted, and in English, generally try to avoid small talk when I can. Um, maybe why I like Finland, but um, in Swiss German, since a lot of what I know is greetings, things like the the, um, I don't find small talk to be a problem, and so I will make it because that's like that's the Swiss German I know. <laughs> Okay, so actually in, a, in another language you feel that that's not a problem. Maybe it has different meanings in different languages or... I don't think it's so much that it has a different meaning in the language so much as that the language is still fo is foreign enough to me that it doesn't, it doesn't sort of wait, feel like it's wasting time the way small talk in a language that I'd consider native feels. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, I'm still speaking this really cool language. Yeah. So... Thank you. I think that's exactly the kind of stuff I was looking for. So, anybody else? Or different things, please. Okay, sorry, sorry. Let's go. I mean, I'm sorry. 